Yeah, politics for the people. My name is Stephanie Stoll Dalton. I may not look like her, but I think the same way. <laughs> We're doing musical hosts today, okay? Um, and I'm Jay, and I'm kidding. And I'm uh, I'm 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 going to host this show about uh, politics for the people. And the subject is yes, Rome is still burning. Or put it this way, is Rome still burning? Okay. We're going to take a, a look at the domestic issues we've been covering all along, um, and how they're doing while Europe is burning. Uh, that includes a whole bunch of things. Uh, so, uh, Stephanie, um, have things gotten better domestically while Rome is burning? Things have not gotten domestic. I ha have not gotten uh, better. Things are status quo and declining. And hopefully the media is not losing ground in covered, covering these topics uh, sufficiently. Um, that's my question is about the proportion of the news uh, attention. Have we lost it to the hot war or are we still getting all our details here? I'm, I'm presuming from what I'm reading, it, it's sounding overwhelming as usual. So perhaps we're not, but that is a concern and we need to uh, look to action here. And the president's looking to action there. So we need a re reconsideration of where the responsibility lies. So, uh, Tim, is the media doing a good job in this time of crisis in Europe? Um, and if not, do you forgive them? They're doing a stand-up job. They're in the field. They're doing what they're designed to do, report facts and get to, uh, tell a story. And they're telling a story. So they're doing, I think, wonderful. Um, I think because news service is 24-7, it's hard for the human psyche to take it all in all at once, 24-7. And I think people get um, emotionally burned out. And that's what I'm afraid of, is that the crisis in uh, Ukraine uh, can cause um, viewer burnout. And um, hopefully that doesn't happen. Okay, well, uh, Karen, now a question for you. Um, you know, if I look at the tube and I, I only, only watch three channels, and I'll tell you which channels I watch in case you're interested, uh, MSNBC, CNN, BBC, and sometimes PBS, the news hour. <laughs> That's about it. Notice the ones that I omitted because I don't want to spoil my brain. Uh, Lord knows it needs to be preserved at my age. Anyway, <clears throat> so what we have here, okay, is the news, um, but um, they are spending a lot of time on, on Ukraine. And as a matter of fact, sometimes, some days, I think I can anticipate what they're going to say. They're going to say there was a bombing of a residential you know, house uh, or building or maternity ward, what have you. And a lot of people died. I know they're going to talk about what's happening at the border and the pathos of the trains and buses and, and walking Ukrainians arrive. Um, I know um, that they're going to talk about uh, Putin and the fact that he's doubling down and everything and and uh, how the Russian troops are behaving themselves and so forth. I know that it's almost the same every day. I'm sorry to tell you, but um, and, and, and the audience, as Tim suggests, you know, wants to hear that, needs to hear that. We all need to know what's going on because these are war crimes in our midst. Um, but are we covering the things that are and, and that makes it static? What I'm telling you is. It seems to be static day after day. I wish I could say there was real dynamic, but it's not so much. Um, and at the other side of things, there is dynamic happening, isn't there, in our domestic issues. How do you feel about that? Well, I feel that it's unfortunate that uh, the media seems to be able to only focus on one crisis at a time <laughs> and then drumbeat it to death until the next crisis appears, in which case then a lot of other issues that I think are important, such as climate change. We talked about the climate change report that got eclipsed by um, the current Ukraine crisis. All these kind of factors. Poor Anthony Fauci is out now. You don't see him anymore. <laughs> so uh, all these things that were so-called crisis issues before are no longer crisis issues and they just seem to get dropped or something until the next crisis and then they'll drop ukraine and go on to that one <laughs> yeah isn't it true it's like who's in charge here anyway you wonder who makes these decisions and you also wonder karen and you taught this for years who follows who 
You know, if I come up with some story domestic or foreign, okay, and it's really juicy, and I have footage and I have a, a hot commentator about it, uh, the likelihood is that the other channels, the other news media are going to pick it up, right? That's the way it works. Yeah. So everybody to the left side of the boat, everybody to the right side of the boat. Uh, who? How is that decided, if you will, among the media, the priorities? Well, you know, the old adage, if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> so the more, if they have media coverage of it, you know, if it's just a meeting of two people somewhere, it's not a very exciting media event, you know, two people walking into a build, building to talk or something. But if they have, you know, footage of somebody lying on the ground, you know, dead or something, then that's uh, considered a more of a uh, put it at the top of the news story. So it's uh, kind of unfortunately based on uh, sensational and human interest, that kind of thing. Yeah, isn't that true? And maybe... Uh, I wish there was a way in which the media could act independent or more independent and pick their own priorities and uh, do it on their own time, so to speak. So, Stephanie, you know, if we peel the Ukrainian curtain back, just hold it for a minute, suspend it, if you will, and look at the domestic scene. What, if anything, is troubling you about the dynamic on the domestic scene? Well, I think my, my I'm driven by the question of what is it not that democracy is the most important target of of all of our work? Is it not that um, we have to um, be, be preserve democracy at all costs and uh, certainly it, at home? Our, our operation of a democracy is the most important place to, to, to be, be making sure we're covering our bases and that we have a balance. So we look at what we're doing at home, but we also then have to have the ba keep that balance and have that be our priority while looking to the other hot war issues. And also China's taking advantage of all of, of the sanctions uh, that are depriving Russia of its ordinary incomes and they're snapping that up. But so, yes, so at home, I think it's about how leadership and policy is a, is going to accommodate all of this demand on it and, and also inform how we're supposed to act with regard to our own operations of democracy and then how we're going to address it in uh, the world. Well, do, you, do you see uh, any positive effect of the crisis in Ukraine on the Congress? I mean, is there a certain amount of bipartisan that pops up uh, when when democracy is threatened in this in the same in this incredible way in Ukraine? Sadly, I think there's a lot of interest in friendship with Russia or alliance in 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 the ways that we have learned are are just obnoxious. I see a complete reflection of the game plan that's been going on here since 19 since since 2016 election and all the things that Russia is saying and doing and Putin. So there so the the. Um, there, there are uh, there is a portion of our government that has absorbed the Putin strategy and the Russian game plan and uh, talk in turning around uh, issues on themselves. Uh, um, in, in other words, like he, he's a criticizing Ukraine of of having bioweapons, and of course that that's what is one of the tactics is that you uh, accuse other people of doing what it is that you intend to do. So, but my answer to the question is that yes, I see that there are uh, a lot of people uh, in our government, unfortunately, uh, would like, it would benefit. They want the benefits of having Ukraine absorbed by the Russia country, which is, is horribly de detrimental. to. Oh, uh, so Tim, when you pull back the curtain or, you know, lift the blanket a little on the news as it is happening, as it is changing in this country, um, do you find that there's any positive effect of the crisis over democracy in Ukraine on the way mm, the members of Congress, um, specifically the GOP, are conducting themselves. Thank you for asking that question. Absolutely. And and what is the what is the the look? What is the look behind the curtain? And that is to see the personal attributes of a dictator, the inhumanity, the brutality, the narcissism, the paranoia. Um, the list goes on and. Those who were supporting someone kind of like that as a former president we had 
uh, they start to see maybe that's not such a great idea to fight an autocrat really looks like. And they think twice maybe before they start going down the autocratic road uh, because it seems to be um, inherent of all auto autocrats to have these warped uh, aspects of their personality. There's no separating the personality from the dictator, from the dictator, from the autocrat. You know, but there's a tension on that, isn't there? Because at the same time, the GOP is has always been, at least in recent times, uh, dedicated to try to bring the Democrats down, uh, to make Joe Biden look foolish and weak and impotent and so forth. And some of them cannot resist that opportunity now um, because this, you know, this crisis is really beyond anyone's control or very hard to control it. Um, and so they take the opportunity to uh, to criticize him over it. So, so am I right? I see a tension, OK, between the GOP normal approach at trying to attack Biden, undermine Biden. At the same time, as you say, um, perhaps there are some members of the GOP and some people in the base, actually, in the country who who. Um, understand better what Trump was about, who understand better what democracy is and how it could be lost. What are your thoughts about that tension? Well, that tension was there before Ukraine, and that was the old GOP that said, you know, we have a protocol, we have a certain demeanor about us, we have a certain platform and principles as the GOP party. Uh, as we know, 2016, a lot of those principles and platforms went away and it was following a cult personality versus a GOP platform. So that tension has been there. Um, I think most of it's been swept under the rug and the, the cult of personality won the day. But that's the beauty of, I think, looking at Putin under a microscope to say, hey, there are similarities between this guy and the guy we just got rid of, number 45. And I, I think that tension's back, and it's good to have that tension. And I'd like to see more people realize that um, a platform is more important than a personality. You know, uh, Karen, we have a lot of issues, miles to go before we, we finish the discussion about all the un, unfinished business on the domestic side. But, but certainly one thing we have been focused on for the past two plus years is COVID. Um, so I ask you to report on COVID. Um, there, there's a tension there too. Uh, there are still people who, you know, don't believe it, who don't want to wear a mask uh, or a, uh, a take a vaccine. On the other hand, uh, on the on the flip side of that, there seems to be a, a scientific implication that maybe the surge is going down, uh, and the various government agencies are saying you don't need to take those steps anymore. Uh, where does that put it uh, in terms of the domestic agenda? Uh, I think uh, because they there is a kind of consensus by the CDC that it is uh, going down. In fact, many states are, including Hawaii, are, are removing their mask mandates, that it's kind of declining in terms of news coverage, uh, which it used to lead. It was leading the news for what the last year, I think, at least every uh, the first story on the news was always some COVID story with usually Anthony Fauci or somebody like that. But so I think uh, we're beginning to see that eclipsed by Ukraine. And um, I'm not sure they're going to pick up the coverage again. I think it's uh, being written off as, you know, in the decline right now. Yeah, so is, is it behind us? If it's behind us, let's assume it's been dealt with, right? Either it um, it 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 um, it, it reduced its uh, its, uh, its its lethality, its its infectiousness as a matter of the development, the um, you know uh, the, the the track of the virus, you know the evolution of the virus, or because we took good steps. Who gets credit? Uh, can can we say that Biden should, should get credit here? Can we say that the government should get credit? Or as some people feel, it just went away by itself. And they always told us it was going to go away by itself. No, I think there was huge steps taken by Biden and the government to uh, accelerate its departure. And if they hadn't taken those steps, we wouldn't see it going away, um, you know, happily seeing it going away. You know, the uh, insistence that all government employees had to be vaccinated, the push to vaccinate people in general, 
by Biden and government mandates and so forth, I think was critical in reaching the critical mass they needed to the, get the vaccine, you know, under control. Yeah. Or not the vaccine, the virus under control. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, I, uh, since you, uh, you know, the ordinary uh, host in the in the evolution in the in the revolving musical chairs of the show, I saved a very difficult question for you. Are you happy about that? I'm thrilled. <laughs> Voting. Hit me with your best shot, Jay. I'm going to give you my best shot. Voting. There was an article in the New Yorker three, four days ago about how busy, busy, busy the GOP was working on on um, denying free and fair voting to a, a huge number of people in this country, working on it every single day, working on it in so many legislatures, working on it with uh, people running for office like Secretary of uh, State in various states. Busy, 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 busy. And, um, and, the, and the thrust of the article in The New Yorker is, uh, boy, we got a problem. Do we have a problem, Stephanie? Are we addressing the problem? The voting rights bills seem to be dead. Let me spell that: D E A D, dead in Congress. What's what are we what are we going to do? What's going to happen here? That's the question. That that really is the challenge, and this has been going on for a long time. As the Republicans have been focusing on this this work at at these lower. Uh, level uh, positions, which we thought were, they're not lower level in any sense of importance, but they hire highly prioritize getting people in at the state level that would be on their team. And they've ramped that up. I mean, that's been going on for years along with the gerrymandering and now, but now they're really ramping it up and really focusing on the primary for the secretary of state position in the state and making, and, 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 and the former president is really pushing on that. No, so, so it's demo Democrats who have not paid enough attention to that. And of course, it, it's about winning the presidential contests and, and that's where um, the strength is of the, or the outcomes of the strong work of the Democrats as we, we, we control all three houses and we've had the presidency but now we've got to get back to business and take care of what it is that the republicans understand is so important and may win the day as a result of that so it's a huge concern and it's a negligence on the part of democrats there's no excuse you have to do the whole thing it has to be a balanced approach it has to be comprehensive and you have to consistently stay on top of it at least Biden's coming back on the judges. So the other piece is the judiciary, right? Where, where the Republicans have been doing nothing but getting GOP MAGA uh, judges in there. And finally, now Biden's in, and he's he's appointed more judges uh, than anybody ever before, including Trump. So you're you're on the mark here. This is this is highly important. Is we we need yes, we need it, the leaders to attend to this. And um, and as to the Voting Rights Act, that that's just a shame. It's criminal especially for the people who've devoted their lives getting that legislation through one time already in states that already have abided by it. So we need to get that back. And there are people working on that. They're not getting much coverage, not as much as they should be getting. There again, who is the media touting? Enough already maybe on the war stuff and not that we don't. We're well, not can I tag, tag on to that comment right there? Yeah. And that is, how do we know the stuff's not getting done under, you know, behind closed doors? Just because the media is not reporting on it doesn't mean the Democrats aren't working on voting rights and back, you know, back uh, behind the scenes efforts or even build back better. Uh, we just don't hear about it because Ukraine is, has taken and rightly so most of the oxygen is now the room. Well, if I could just comment to back, um, I, it's just in looking, I've been looking at the state's the state's com, com, uh, campaigns for these offices like Secretary of State and the Republicans are doing very well, especially in in the the uh, the, the states that are critical for um, the Republicans. So that's how uh, that's the, so I don't think the coverage has been reduced. It's just not headlines. So that's another part of it. Where is the coverage? Fauci's on page 39 of the post instead of page three or one. So, I mean, it, it, they're all those facets of, of how they're gonna push this stuff out and somebody needs to be tweaking it to keep the important undone work that desperately needs attention and is gonna make the difference between our having an operating democracy and not. And that needs to get out there. And who's making that decision? I guess it's citizens re requesting it, but that's another question is who's pushing that 
it's not leadership or and if it's not leadership then who does push that's, that's, yeah that's another question um you know can i just step in here with a comment um you can say the press isn't reporting some of the stuff that democrats have been doing um you know particularly on on, on these uh, elections but in fact i'm going to say it in hawaiian i'm going to use the native hawaiian language the two voting rights bills okay in congress we all know and there's nothing more to report on that are make that means dead and um that's that's a fact so if the if the democrats are doing anything about voting rights in congress you could fool me <laughs> anyway let's let's go forward you know one thing tim that uh, stephanie mentioned was the judiciary okay and that, that biden had the opportunity to uh appoint katanji uh, brown jackson that's good um i don't think it's going to make that much difference in the court and we have some real jokers that um uh, that uh, Trump appointed, who are doing amazing cases, cases, cases that make your blood boil and your cereal curdle. I'm telling you, we could go into that now. Suffice to say, there are some really strange federal judges on the bench that Trump appointed. They're not qualified. Their sensibilities are bad. Uh, they're politically had and so forth. Still today, years later. And it's very sad. And they say, OK, that the judiciary is really the backstop on all these investigations. You can stop an investigation with the judiciary and you can encourage one with the judiciary. So right now I'm asking you about investigations, uh, which, um, you know, um, arguably are important issues and should be dynamic issues. Um, but as other issues, they have been you know, covered by by the Ukraine crisis. Okay? So we're talking about the select committee. Uh, we're talking about the prosecutions of the Proud Boys and all that. Um, we're talking about trying to stop insurrectionists in the future. Um, we're, we're trying to investigate. Hey, we're trying to prosecute Trump in the Manhattan DA's office. Look what happened to that. If you were hoping that that conviction would have felt fallen within Section 3 of uh, the 14th Amendment. Forget about it. That prosecution's gone, gone, gone. Make, you know what it means. Uh, so what, what I'm saying is, uh, how are we doing on that? Are we following, you know, are we following up on that as a country, or, or are we spending all our time watching MSNBC? I think the Select Committee has gotten a lot more interviews, a lot more evidence um, they're starting to put the rough draft of the report together. We're now mid-March, and months ago, you and I and everyone on our shows would say, hey, this stuff has to be out by basically June 1st, or else it's going to be too late. So I think they're starting to gather and, and organize what their brief is going to look like and, and what that report's going to look like. So I think that work continues. Um, you may not have the high rollers that actually go in and testify in front of the select committee. That's fine. We don't need them. It'd be nice, but uh, they have the evidence and it will be reported. Okay, and, well, I, I mean, like the notion that they don't have any power to, uh, you know, execute what they find. It has to go to the uh, Department of Justice. Yeah, that's so what if he doesn't press and, and, and I'll go one step further. Uh, there'll be a candidate in standing. I don't know who it is, but they'll take that select committee report and say, I'm challenging 14th Amendment, paragraph three. I'm challenging Donald Trump as a viable candidate that he's ineligible due to this report and the evidence of finding within it. It's a good point. Okay, I just you know it's great we had so I'll many conversations. I'll lose another pizza, I'm sure, but you know. Oh uh, well, we had so many conversations about these things, you know, and I I actually miss those good old days when we were bearing down on all these domestic issues, and now you know we really have to handle Ukraine. We we must talk about it as the greatest outrage of our lifetime. Um, but, you know, Karen, there are other outrages happening. We have the Supreme Court, which is not going to be much affected by uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. Uh, we have a, you know, a conservative majority that's probably going to slam Roe v. Wade. Uh, that's going to vote against voting rights. Um, there's all kinds of things. I mean, how do you feel about that? Is there a dynamic in the judiciary? Is there a dynamic on all these various, what do you call legal and 
cultural issues uh, that are coming were coming, I don't know if they are coming, um, before the public and the institutions we count on uh, to deal with them. Well, I would say the dynamic is that the Democrats seem to be losing all of them, <laughs> primarily. Here we have uh, the EPA is now being a big case before the Supreme Court. Looks like it might lose its teeth to be able to execute any power in terms of global climate change and emissions of uh, power plants. So they're all leaning, of course, all the conservative judges are leaning to give um, the power plants more power or less and take away the power of the EPA. So uh, that's a down downer. And then we, of course, we have abortion coming up, which is not gonna look good. We have uh, lost, it seems, the Trump uh, in New York case, you know, where they all uh, disintegrated before our eyes. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen at the state level where um, there's a prosecutor, the Secretary of State of New York is prosecuting supposedly a similar case to what the New York City case was, but I haven't heard any um, status report on that at all. So uh, I would say interlegally, um, the picture is not too good at the moment. Let me ask you about some of the more, I say mundane, but they're really not mundane at all. But they have been, you know, talked about less. Uh, let's talk about, mm, let's see, um, tax reform, uh, wealth disparity, infrastructure, big tech abuses. Um, did I mention immigration, social what? justice, poverty? Um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of, I don't want to call them second tier, but we haven't talked about them as much. And it seems to me we're not talking about them at all right now. No, and I think another issue is that a lot of the appointees uh, have not been uh, past the, um, you know, committees they need to uh, be installed in office, like the uh, Justice Department, uh, some appointees there, some appointees at the um, um FCC, the FTA, all the uh, regulatory bureaus seem to have been stalled out in terms of getting in the people that Biden wanted. So that's so anti-monopoly legislation is essentially stalled as well. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, let's go to you with an easy one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a trap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, the economy, inflation, uh, all that, jobs, all that. Now, you know, you, there were those who said a few weeks ago that Biden was doing great, there were more jobs. And there were those who said, well, not really, because inflation is eating up the benefit. Um, and now on top of that, we have we have oil you know, prices um, and various other supply line issues and cost issues um, that will predictably result from uh, the shrinking of an interdependent global economy. Um, so are we doing anything about that? Are we doing anything, you know, at the Fed level? Are we, are we doing anything to avoid disparity and poverty in this country? What about all those initiatives? Uh, what, uh, what about Tim's favorite uh, bill? Is that going anywhere? No, Tim, that was, the, the, we call it the pizza bill. Um, <laughs> Um, what, what you know? What, uh, what's happening with that? And have we have we turned our backs on all those things? Well, I to, to the list you gave us of your viewing habits on TV. I'd like to add Bloomberg. Well, his Bloomberg's covering the stuff 24 seven. OK, so and they're also running a sidebar that that kind of picks up on the, the major news points, too. So I highly recommend it if you want to catch up fast without and it, it even runs the bar during commercials. So um, uh, however, I mean, it's high level. They've got all world level global experts coming in talking about all of these things. And, and, and so that kind of gives you the big picture. But I mean, the, the, the problem with the war in Ukraine and, and what Putin is doing and, and China is going to benefit like crazy from um, is uh, uh, to, you know, to, and the relationship is growing stronger, I, I submit, uh, regardless of, you know, any finer points, uh, you know, about their value systems or whatever. But, um, you know, it, 
uh, the, the inflation is bad. Now it's good. Now it's going to get better. Now we're going to have the rate hike next week. No, we're not. I mean, so all of that is on the air about going this way and that way. But what is encouraging about that is that they're responsive. I mean, the people are responsive, these experts, you know, to changing situations. And that's what's really important. So that when they do get to the, the point of decision there, they're bringing this myriad of viewpoints and, and having to smash that and do something about um, uh, putting it into a, a reasonable policy that's going to have some possibility of success for us. But yeah, so I think um, the economic crisis is on us and Biden can't pay attention to that. I mean, it's just like the Supreme Court, as you mentioned, um, the new one going in is, is going to make some difference probably, uh, at least as, uh, you know, somebody standing there saying things that are important to hear. But um, you know, I think we haven't done anything about moving forward on changing the Supreme Court. So this is another one of those great big, if to totally important and influential institutions that yes, the State Department needs to have, have the rest of its complement. Yes, all the rest of them do too. It's critical. And that's been, uh, you know, uh, our detriment to our detriment and to our vulnerability, increasing it, not having those, uh, the executive branch filled out by the hundreds of thousands. So anyway, but the Supreme Court, uh, Biden's not doing any, or is he there? You ask those questions, say, how do you know if he is or he is? And presumably he has the committee that's working on that, right? But we've got to have a change in that. Committee, uh, the committee found that nothing needed to be changed. On this yes, that's true. That was about, what, two weeks ago, 10 days ago, yeah. yeah. So well, let me, let me move on to Tim with uh, perhaps the most uh, complex question of our discussion here. Uh, can you forgive me, Tim? Always. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody will argue that Biden has done a lot to repair the damage with the EU and NATO. Um, of course, um, it, it, the jury's still out on what happens. Um, you know, the, the failure of the uh, Polish deal is not necessarily good for him. Um, but, you know, one thing I have noticed in the past few days is this. There are a lot of countries uh, in Africa and in South America who, who have not condemned Russia, who have not joined with the United States or, or NATO or the EU. They're all on their own. And some of them are saying, I mean, I, this is not a direct quote, but it's close. We love Russia. We'll always be with Russia. Russia will always be our friend. Holy moly, how did that happen? Um, and that's in other places in the world. And of course, you have China, which is not willing to take a position. So my question is, does this reveal something that we were not attending to? Is it possible uh, that we, we spent a little too much time on EU and NATO uh, when, when we could have, should have spent some time on these other places as well? It's not that we weren't attending to it. We weren't aware to begin with. You have to remember, much of Africa is a social, socialistic societies and communism had fertile ground in, in, in countries that were desperately poor. And so, um, you know, communism was very appealing and it has been. And, uh, you know, again, China has since the early 90s has become ingratiated in many of these African nations. And so communism is not a dirty word. Uh, socialism is not a dirty word. And uh, so when they say, you know, Russia's been our friend. Uh, Russia has brought in goods and services. China has brought in goods and services, humanitarian aid, engineering, uh, infrastructure improvements to many of these African nations. And so uh, it's not that we weren't paying attention, uh, is we weren't paying attention way back since the 1990s. We are now, because guess what? There's um, raw, raw minerals that we need for our computer chips. So now we're paying attention but uh, only because of that. Yeah, um, and before we leave that very point, which is very important, um, like the cobalt in the Congo, um, now, now China has control of that. Mm. Um, but uh, remember Ukraine, uh, there are many rare earths in Ukraine. There are many, there are many um, important materials in Ukraine that we have, we have been complacent about. We have assumed that there'll always be a supply line. If Russia takes over Ukraine, we won't have that anymore. I don't think, I don't think we are focusing on that. I don't think we are focusing on manufacturing. 
Uh, and I think to the extent that Trump talked about trying to rebuild manufacturing, he, he didn't see it as an interdependent world. He didn't see, see it as global supply lines. Uh, he figured somehow all those rare earths would get to us. Wrong, wrong. Okay, we're out of time, but I want to ask you guys, um, you know, to give your last thoughts. Um, and and I have a suggested question for you. you know? um, my question is this: you know, we have been dealing with all of us, uh, you know, this 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 the de the degradation of the United States, the loss of democracy the loss of social justice, the loss of rationality. I mean, we could go on. And it has affected me, I'll tell you. I'm sure it's affected most right-thinking people I know. And it's just, it's a, it's a drumbeat, has been a drumbeat since Trump was elected. And um, now, on top of that, we have Ukraine, where we see a, an absolute outrageous dictator, a murderous dictator, get away with this every single day murdering civilians, women and children all day long. And that's another burden. That's another degradation of the world order of, 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 of morality, global morality. And all the while, as we discussed in this program, um, the real work has, has not been done, um, perhaps to the, the extent that it might have been. So my question is very subjective. We'll start with you, Karen. How do you feel about that? One thing I think that's unfortunate uh, in terms of coverage and so forth is I think a lot of things have been done with this uh, first bill that Biden passed, but we're not going to see the results of it for, you know, four or five years, like rebuilding the infrastructure. Uh, a lot of changes that he has made, you know, is not immediate. It's something you see in the future. And unfortunately, I don't think that registers with a lot of people. You know, it's sort of immediate, what they see immediately before their eyes um, seems to be what they think is gonna, gonna be. And so uh, I think it's unfortunate there's not more coverage of like the different ingredients of these bills and what's really gonna change. And, uh, you know, what's, for example, I did see that, um, both the uh, Republican Party and the Democratic Party agree that um, the uh, early pundits for the party agree that uh, the presidency, the um, Senate now is possibly could go back to the Democrats. And that's uh, if, and this is a big caveat, if they choose the middle type, the old type of Republican in the, at the local level, then um, then it won't, It'll, uh, but if they choose these rabid Trumpites at the local level, then there's a chance people are turning away from these people. And that means that there's an opening for, um, you know, the senators in the, to go um, democratic. So I think that's good news. And I think uh, from what I, I watched PBS news last night and actually they had a whole bunch of bills they were, touting that were bipartisan that had passed this week. So I do think a lot of this bipartisan is not covered. And we don't know, like, for example, there's an anti-lynching bill that just passed was bipartisan support, but you know, it doesn't really get the um, news that the uh, other issues do. So I think it's unfortunate that, you know, we're not really aware of what actually is being done in the Congress. Well, taking it all together, I mean, you're a professional in this, uh, and, you, and you do watch and think and apply critical thinking. Um, are you more or less optimistic about the future of the of the country than you were before uh, Ukraine? Well, I don't think Ukraine has any place in my thinking, but I think I'm more optimistic because I think people are beginning to turn away from the Trump Trumpite candidates. Uh, and they're beginning to see Trump, I think, decline in popularity. And so, and I think people in his own party are turning away from him. So um, I don't think it's a Ukraine issue, but I do. Uh, I also saw where the results of this re, um, uh, redistricting, you know, uh, voting uh, votes have basically turned out to be uh, even Stephen, you know, there's the redistricting benefited the Republicans and the Democrats to the same degree. So uh, it didn't really, it's not really going to affect the next election. Yeah. There are some stories, I think, that we don't see covered that 
Um, okay, I just I just want to go on record to say that if if the Democrats take the Senate um, in uh, the next election, I'm I'm going to need hospitalization. Um, uh, that's how I feel about it. Uh, St Stephanie. Uh, are you more or less optimistic or pessimistic given the compounding of these these threats to our world? I'm very pessimistic, and to put it succinctly, uh, to preserve our democracy, which has operated beautifully in its form for a long, long time and gotten us to the top of the heap here on the globe. However, if we don't do something about changing from a skeet shoot act, act play, uh, in, in our government started probably with the uh, involvement of Newt Gingrich years ago and get out of this everybody piling on everybody else, we are not going to make it. And so we've got to grow up, get out of the middle school playground uh, and, and get on with everybody on board. We have we have listed in this program how many things that are not active enough active yet in the public's uh, uh, knowledge. I mean, which says something about what's going on and we should know more about uh, it. And we have to have all hands on board to get at all of these issues if we're going to maintain our leadership position and the quality of life that we have achieved because of that. So, okay, Tim, it falls on you now. And if you don't give a good answer, I'm going to stamp my feet and create a nuclear war. Been done before. The answer is this. I am, although I'm pessimistic, I'm seeing glimmers of optimism. And it's optimism via tragedy. The tragedy of Ukraine is teaching the world a lesson, the United States a to remind us of a lesson of what a despot looks like, what a dictator whose flawed personality and the, the carnage that he can wreck upon a nation and its people. It's a lesson for us that we learned in World War II, Vietnam and every other war conflict. And it's being played out right before our very eyes. And it's a reminder of why we need to preserve democracy and avoid despots, autocrats and people with his personality and like his personality that have been our former president. Wow, what a panel. What a discussion. Thank you all. Tim Apicella, Stephanie Stolt-Dalton, Karen Buzzard, thank you very much for this discussion here on Politics for the People. Aloha. <laughs>